So as we all try to come to terms with this pandemic, the big overarching question is whether our national strategy for fighting it is right or not. There have been very few medical voices suggesting the strategy is wrong. But on the 12th of this month, in an interview with Paul Cullen in the Irish Times, Dr Martin Feely, who at that time was clinical director of the Dublin Midlands Hospital Group, was extremely critical of what he described as the draconian restrictions. Shortly after he made those comments, he resigned from his position in the HSE. Until now, he has declined all other interviews, but he's here tonight. And joining him is the RCSI's Professor Sam McConkey. Welcome to you, Professor McConkey. Welcome to you very much, Dr. Feely. Look, for our viewers, spell out, if you will, what you were basically saying in the Irish Times. Thanks, Miriam. I'll try and be succinct. Uh, the key point, what everything hinges on, is the, the disease. It's so different to any other or most other respiratory diseases. Back when this broke in February or March, and when we saw the images that came from Italy, we were scared, absolutely scared. I estimated at that time that we had 15% of the ICU capacity that we would need. Now, why were we scared? We thought we were looking at a replica of 1917-1918 flu. That was a completely indiscriminate killer, just lethal across all ages, everybody. And we thought that's what we were looking at. We did what was correct, and by that I mean the government and NEFID. They locked down the country, tried to isolate individuals, isolate communities, and try and prevent the spread. And the plan was flattening the curve, as you may well remember. What does flattening the curve mean? Then I, I think we've lost track of what flattening the curve does mean. Flattening the curve means that we try and slow down the spread of the disease through the community so that at any one time the medical system, the hospital system effectively, can manage the number of people who need that treatment. That is flattening the curve. We succeeded, or the country succeeded, way beyond what was expected. We never, I don't think we ever expected to get to a point where we had single-digit numbers of cases happening around the country. Uh, so, <clears throat> as it transpired, we discovered this disease is not 1917, not 1918. We discovered that, in effect, if you're under 65, if you have no other illnesses or no diseases, and in particular if you're not overweight, and that seems to upset people, but this is a fact. If you don't have conditions and are not overweight, Mary, your risk from this disease is not negligible by any means, but it's not much worse than what we call the seasonal flu. That's for that age group. So when that comment is taken out of context, it's, it's very unfair. It's only for that group of people that I'm saying this disease is not much worse than the seasonal flu. I think that's the key point. So if we move on then and, and accept that, and I think Sam and everybody else will accept that, and if they don't, then I find it hard to believe because that's an established fact about the, the virulence and the lethality of this virus in that age group. So that's the vast majority of the Irish population, particularly the working population. So the strategy that we adopted was for a universally lethal condition. It isn't that, so we need a different strategy. The strategy is extremely costly, and I'm not just talking about the cost of the exchequer. The cost of the exchequer is minimal, nothing compared to the others. It's nothing compared to the cost of 12 years ago when we were hit with a 64 or $66 billion bill. Nothing like that. But the cost to the, the community, financially and socially, is enormous. And one of the difficulties with this is that we cannot measure those costs. So if you try and draft some kind of cost-benefit ratio, you're at a loss because the cost side is abstract. Yeah, I can't put a number on it. But I can tell you the mood of the people is depressed. The mood of the country is depressed. And what I'm suggesting is, or what I'm asking really is, uh, 
and I really am asking, I would like to base, I would like people to consider this and say, can we allow young people, young working people, people with businesses, people with mortgages to pay, can we get them to live a life rather than just exist a life? Okay, yeah? let me come That's back in I'm there asking. for a moment. I'll bring you in a moment, Sam. The only thing is, though, Dr. Feedy, I suppose key to what you're talking about is that, you know, people who do have underlying illnesses, people who are overweight, how do we protect them without isolating them or even risking death? How do you protect them? And has that ever been achieved anywhere? <clears throat> well, I don't really want to get into different countries because that argument doesn't get anywhere. It's, it's not productive. The thesis is that at the moment, these at-risk people, and up to quite recently, say during June and July, they were very effective. And if you look at the case numbers in the country, the over 65s and the at-risks actually amounted to less than 4% of those. As time has gone on since the end of August, that number has crept up to 10%. Now, what does that suggest? It suggests to me that maybe these people thought that well, this condition is gone, or I'm fed up cocooning, I'm going to go out and live my life. So the at-risk maybe are taking risks that they shouldn't take. And my theory is that people at risk, if they are protected by themselves, we know all the measures you have to take, and more importantly, if they are protected and they can be protected by the rest of the community, so if I have an elderly relative and they're at home and if I go to their home, then I take precautions. They're taking precautions. So they, those precautions are in place at the moment and I don't see why they can be any different if we move to okay, liberating me, things a bit. Let me bring in Sam McConkie. What would you say to Dr. Field? Um, I strongly agree that having a national debate about our long-term strategy for dealing with COVID is a really important thing to have and then to have vision and leadership and decision after that debate to help us move forward as one. I, I would advocate a completely different uh, route for about eight or nine reasons. Uh, one is that this famous herd immunity possibly is more of a speculative theory than a definite proven fact. We've seen instances where people get COVID-19 a second time with, with a, a, a different virus, and that's been demonstrated multiple times. Similarly, the impact on people, say, if we take 55 years of age, is maybe about one in 200 or 250 of them die. At 65, it's maybe more like 1% die. At 75, maybe 2% die. Unfortunately, then at 85, it's maybe up 14% die, and at 95, maybe a quarter of people who get it die. So, so there is a significant mortality, even in people. Now, I'm 55. I know Dr. Feely's older than I am, but well, that, actually, that's well, very we substantial hear what you're numbers. saying, and people know that. But then we keep hearing, I suppose, Professor, about the exponential rise. But the cases have gone up. But thankfully, the deaths and hospitalizations haven't yeah. gone up accordingly. The hospitalizations are rising now, and the deaths take uh, but several weeks. But not exponentially, as people had worried about. I think there's a lag time. So it just remember how the people all came from northern Italy in February, and we didn't have any deaths with all those folk coming from northern Italy and coming from skiing and, and, and coming from Cheltenham. There were nobody dying at the time when Cheltenham was going on. We weren't talking about deaths. We were talking about considering travel restrictions. So it, there's, a, there's a lag. It takes a while for it to spread. The second thing I would say is that young people who get this COVID-19, some get scarred lungs, scarred hearts, scarred brains, get clots. So there's quite a phenotype of Come disease that we don't fully understand yet that's in, in young people. Come back in there. Uh, what Sam says is true, except that there are 15 or 16 reasons why he would disagree with me. There aren't. I would say to you, Sam, as people, you're, you're quoting figures for the age groups. Everybody, right through all age groups. 7% of our under 17s are obese. They are at risk. So right through every age group, there are people at risk. I didn't say everybody under 65 was safe. I didn't at all. I said if you're under 65, you're not overweight, you don't have hypertension and another list as long as you're around that we can identify with remarkable accuracy, you're not at risk. So I think it's unfair to start throwing out those kind of numbers to undermine my argument. I think the challenge is separating out 
the young sort of healthy people who are not at most risk from the elderly is very difficult because for example in a nursing home it's mostly young healthy people who go in to do the cooking do the caring do the management and the nursing home residents who are the most vulnerable and the most elderly actually need young people to care for them i'm not sure what your point is you've made a couple of points that that uh, actually support my argument but let's go to something we have learned during the peak of the academic epidemic we learned a very important lesson that people in our ICUs the staff who were working with the highly infective and infectious patients with aerosolization kind of conditions they learned to manage those conditions manage those patients with virtually zero transmission mm. to the staff. I think that lesson is hugely important. Mm. And if we transfer that lesson to our healthcare workers, not just in the hospital, but in our nursing homes, we can manage this condition. Yeah, I mean, this, this is true. Once you test everyone on the way in, both staff and patients, and uh, you know who's positive, then you can protect staff and other patients from catching it. That involves testing everyone of the staff in a nursing home every five days to see who's just acquired it. No, I didn't, I didn't mention testing and I'm not going to. I'm just no. sticking with the principle that I can go in and I can look after patients without transferring or having the disease transferred to me. Yeah. That's what PPE does if it's used properly and if we used all the hygiene and all the measures that we have learned full PPE, proper hygiene, I can stop transmission in but both directions. But to be fair that you are an experienced, very, very well-respected doctor, it probably wouldn't be as easy for other people like carers to do that? No, they can be taught and can be trained and they have been. That's, we no, I, I, I think it's, successful. I don't think that's, that isn't, uh, I don't believe that's a problem. Okay. The, the issue is that you have to know that the source person is positive and then you can apply the PPA. So when you're talking about intensive care, you know the patient is positive, so then you know to use all okay, the let PPA. Let me ask you a general question, because I'd say people at home, like they do get confused and, and, and they are worried about strategies. I mean, at the bottom line, I suppose, is at the moment, Sam McConkey is, we've had lockdown and now we've restrictions, but we know as soon as we ease the restrictions that the cases go right back up again. Mm. So isn't there something in what Dr. Feely says about we looking at strategy. No, so it doesn't have to be that way. It, the, the, I would point everyone to look at Australia. Big country, 25 million people, and they've actually a suppressed transmission in most parts of Australia completely. So once you get down to zero and control people coming into the country, then you can actually prevent it spreading uh, in that country. Many countries like Faroes and Greenland and Guernsey and New Zealand famously and, and many Asian countries have done that. They were ready for this. They knew about SARS-1 and they were ready with a plan. So Australia is getting there. Melbourne's gone from 800 cases a day to 10 and it will get to zero, I'm sure. And I suppose, Dr. Feely, from your point, you're a leading medic in this country, right? But I suppose what you're saying isn't going just against what actually. Professor McConkey says, but against the WHO, against the HSE, against places like John Hopkins University. Do you ever reflect on that? I do, but I think I'm capable of thinking for myself. But there are many groups, and particularly in the United Kingdom, a serious bunch of serious scientists, and similarly in Belgium, uh, hundreds of scientists have written to their governments saying exactly what I'm saying. Now, we're all wrong, but at least it deserves a debate. And that's all I would ask for. I don't agree with... Can I go back, Miriam, please, to, to the last point by Sam? We can't get back... No matter what we do, we can't get back to where New Zealand is. OK? We've lost... We've missed that boat by a long Three shot. Months. By Christmas, we can be there. No. Australia had 800 cases a day a few weeks ago. Now, two months later, it's down to tiny numbers. So we, we can't get back Nobody there. in their wildest dream believes that you can eradicate this disease. Now, you, you have to accept that. I'm sorry, but yeah, you, you can have eliminate to... it from a geographic territory. No, you so can't. Faroes, Greenland, New Zealand have, have done that. It you can be reintroduced. You cannot eliminate this disease. Why not? Can I give, well, here's an example. There, in the community, first of all, the first Irish case wasn't the first Irish case. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the first Irish case about which all the who was about, at the same time as that patient was in isolation, there was a patient 100 miles away in intensive care for two weeks yeah. who had COVID, yeah? Nobody ever found out how that patient got that disease. 
there was no tracing of any kind, no identifiable. Three, two, three weeks ago, a group of golfers went out of Dublin. Yeah? One of them developed a disease unrelated to COVID, went into hospital, was tested positive, and 20 of the colleagues of, of a bunch of 40 were tested positive. Now, there are 20 people, Sam, walking around the community mm. from different areas of Dublin mm. who nobody knew about, and you're telling me you can identify those and get rid of the disease. I'm sorry. So, so with Quick the social point. restrictions, we can get the numbers really low, as we had in June, and then get them even lower down to zero. So there's a time when it actually dies out. It doesn't have a chronic form. Miriam, can I come in? Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. The second half of my argument is the cost of all this, Sam, and the damage it's doing to children, to our youth, our young people who are, are already worried enough about what, where they're going in their lives, how to get a job, how to get an education. The people who are losing their jobs, the people who are losing their salaries can't pay their mortgages. Yeah. Now really, someone but, has to talk for those yeah, people. No, but I agree. The cost will be shorter having three or four months of firm restrictions and then getting rid of it. Look at China, look at Australia, their economies are back up and running. They're playing football, they're having their pool okay. parties. So you can actually come out the other end, because what you're proposing will last for years. It'll go up and down like a yo-yo for many years. Sorry, you're the one that and has the policy that's going to last for Dr. years. Dr Feely, <laughs> one very last quick question to you. A lot of people listening will probably find what you say very interesting, but they'd say the price could be very high. In other words, it's, it, it's a strategy that involves perhaps people dying. I, I've just outlined, I think, that we can isolate and protect the vulnerable to the same degree as we are at the moment. Now, if, if you brought flattening the curve to its theoretical conclusion, Miriam, and people forget this, everybody in the country comes in contact with this disease. That is, in theory, what happens with flattening the curve. Okay. That's worth remembering. Look, thank you very much, Dr. Feely, for coming in tonight. I appreciate it very much. And to you as well, Sam McConkey, as usual, thank you so much. Louise.